In this interactive video, we're going to talk about art criticism, um, being a crit, how to be a critic of the arts, and um, we're going to try to make the point that you already are a critic of the arts. Um, so the goal here is to just try to um, learn some concepts to try to help refine um, our criticisms of certain artworks and be able to articulate um, our gut feelings a little bit more clearly. So first, there are some goals of responsible criticism and being a responsible art critic. So responsible criticism aims for the, the fullest understanding and particip participation possible. A responsible art critic doesn't just quickly listen to a piece of music or glance at a piece of artwork and be like, uh, don't like it, or uh, it's good, or uh, it sucks, or oh, that's wonderful, right? It, you aim to understand the background and the context and the medium and the form, content, subject matter, and participate with it as much as you possibly can before beginning to craft a criticism. And that is going to mean that you have to be at the height of awareness while you're looking at a work of art in detail or listening to it, um, for instance, or watching it and getting its context down and also knowing something about what its achievement might or might not be in like the history of that particular art form. And responsible criticism, you shouldn't confuse it with popular journalism, like popular journalism today. And because that can sidetrack the critic into being kind of flashy, negative, and cute and dismissive, right? And delivering these, these offhanded, um, uh, witty opinions about things without really participating with the work and trying to understand it. That sort of popular journalism could be considered irresponsible criticism, kind of like the stuff you see on Yelp or a lot of the stuff you'll see on Yelp. Think about it that way, irresponsible criticism where um, somebody will go eat at a restaurant once in the middle of the pandemic, let's say, and have a slightly less than optimal situation and then just trash the entire establishment based on one quick meal. You know what I mean? So to sum up again, the, the responsible critic aims at a full understanding of a work of art. And something that's important to remember is that like, like we kick this um, video off with, you're already an art critic. You already choose what you like and don't like on a practical everyday level. Every time you choose between, let's say, Apocalypse Now, uh, the, the movies Apocalypse Now, or showgirls, or you decide you want to listen to, let's say, Rachmaninoff or BTS, or you say, oh, I love this painting by Caravaggio, and ugh, this is ridiculous. By, I'm just saying, for example, I'm not saying this is ridiculous, right? Anytime you say, I like this more than this, or this more than this, you are practicing art criticism right? Your art criticism is manifest in what you choose on an everyday live, level. You're making a critical choice every time you say that something is good or something's bad. And, you know, most of this everyday criticism is, is kind of low level, to, right? As, as far as what we're, what we're capable of. It's, it's kind of instinctive, Right when we establish our preferences in music and books, literature, in in paintings, right, architecture, film, videos, whatever, you you have been making these kind of judgments of what you like and you don't like since you were, you know, young enough, since you were old enough to make them, 
since you were kids. And the question is, how can we move on to a higher level kind of criticism that's going to take account of the like the subtle distinctions in the arts and move on to more complex and informed choices rather than just the kind of instinctive like it don't like it right a lot of the times we decide we like it or don't like it or it's good or it's bad just based on stuff that really is not critical it it could be just because it appeals to let's say your i don't know baser instincts right or maybe it's because your family likes it right you then like it or your peers like it then you like it those are all considered non-critical choices right so our our goal here is to try to move into a higher level kind of choice by learning about how you um three different levels of art criticism so but first um on the role of participation and criticism it can be immediate but it's also complex at the same time for instance you can look at a work of art and it can grab you like let's say a painting it grabs you and you just want to participate in it immediately like what is going on for some reason it's just pulling me in and then other times you you have to make a concerted effort to participate because it doesn't hit you on that gut level yet and by doing so by making that concerted effort and decision to participate in a work of art you're you're um you're refining your chops you're forcing yourself to engage and participate in something that 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 you wouldn't necessarily um choose from the get-go and you learn quite a bit from this and you open your eyes quite a bit and you get out of the echo chamber of what you think you like and you don't like, right? Um, and again, we've discussed this before, but participation means trying to kind of lose yourself in the artwork and, you know, not to sound too hippie-ish, but to kind of become one with the experience. And it's possible, right? Instead of just looking at it, to engage it at a level where you you kind of lose yourself in your participation and the question's not so much how we become outside of ourselves in relation to the arts but why we may not achieve that condition in the face of art that we know has great power but doesn't yet speak to us right i'm sure that many of us that happens to me all the time i can give you an example um for in in film for instance right if you look at a list of like what are the greatest um films of all time almost invariably they're going to put citizen kane at the top of the list or near the top right now citizen kane is before my time it's black and white the way that the, the actors speak is not they speak in a strange kind of cadence, right? That's unusual to me. And, and, and the, um, you know, the historical times that I grew up in, these people don't dress like me. They don't speak like me or like I ever did. And it's just, I, I can't get into it. I have to force myself. I have to just trust, like, there must be some reason that people are saying that Citizen Kane is one of the greatest films of all time. Doesn't grab me. I gotta force myself to watch that thing. And then I, beyond that, I have to engage um, with the work of other critics. Why is this? Why do you people think this is the greatest film of all time? And then you start to find out about certain, um, you know, about how it broke barriers, right? And, and how, um, and how it set a new tone for film and did things that hadn't been done before and took on issues that hadn't been taken on before. And then you start to be able to appreciate it. But still to this day, I'm not going to go grab a copy of it and just and watch it like, uh, you know, 50 times like I might with 
you know, Pulp Fiction or, or, or the Quentin Tarantino movie, right? It personally, it just, that doesn't grab me. I have to make a concerted effort, right? So developing critical skills will help bridge that gap that we were talking about up here, that gap between, hey, it, this is supposed to be really important, but it doesn't appeal to me, right? There's a gap between the two. When you develop critical skills, you start to bridge that gap and you allow participation with art that might not be immediately appealing to you at the moment. So in essence, that's the purpose of an education in the arts. So there are three kinds of um, criticism and these help us increase our ability to participate in works of art. And they are known as descriptive criticism, interpretive criticism, and evaluative criticism. D-I-E. <laughs> Silly. Don't think die, but it kind of helps to remember. Um, you know, it's an acronym to help you remember descriptive, interpretive, and evaluative. And we'll take each in turn. So descriptive criticism concentrates on the form of a work of art and describes it like exhaustively in all its detail. You describe what you are seeing in minute detail. You describe the important characteristics of, of the work in order to improve your understanding of the um, different relationships and interrelationships that are involved in the work of art. And good descriptive critics, they call our attention to what we might miss in an artistic form because you're paying such careful attention and describing in such detail. And more importantly, good descriptive critics help us learn how to do what they do when they aren't around to do it for us. And by doing descriptive criticism, we can develop and enhance our own powers of observation. They get sharper. They get better and more um, detailed and more acute and astute when we do careful descriptive criticisms. And then Descriptive criticism more than the any other type, more than um, than interpretive or evaluative, is most likely to improve our participation with a work of art because it makes us engage with the work itself. So I'll give you a quick for instance here, a quick one. It's not going to be exhaustive like like um, is described here, but this is the hallucinogenic Toreador by Salvador Dali. And I mean, this is throwing us into the fire here. What a descriptive critic would do was just start carefully describing what is there, right? So you might say, well, at first glance, the painting is colorful and chaotic. And then if we start at the top, it looks like um, they, the whole painting is set in a bull ring that takes yellow and and red tones and there is a face glowing there are a bunch of statues you know lining you know the top of the bull ring and there's a face glowing and looking down on what's happening in the rest of the painting and then as you move down from the top you see that dots are turning into flies, right? And there's some light purple shading where you move down here and the face appears again and you move slowly further down and you start to see this repeating um, image of what turns out to be, when it gets more clear, a statue. 
right? And then moving down from here, you see these dots again turning into flies and re becoming a bunch of multicolored dots. And you move down here and you be can begin to see how these dots come together to form a bull's head. Right, because a toreador just was is the you know the main human being in a bullfight, and you can see the bull's head down here, and then then you see the bull head the the bull which has been hit with a um which is being slaughtered. Its blood is turning into a like a a pool of water and i know you all can't see this but then there's um, a woman lying on a raft in there and then if you look down further you can make out that there's a dalmatian down here um and then over to the right it looks like there's a small child looking up at everything and then pulling up here is where you get the full optical illusions right you see that the statues here and here are the faces of the bullfighter, right? There's the nose. So if, imagine this is the hat, the big wide brim hat. Here's the nose and the nose that's repeating and the chin and the mouth. And if you look at it as the statue, then this white and green um, cloth is the statue's skirt. And over here, the red is the statue's skirt. But when you're looking at it like it's the bullfighter, this is his shirt and tie and shirt and tie. I mean, this could go on forever. I chose a really crazy one to do a descriptive <laughs> criticism of because of how rich this is. But that gives you an idea of how you do a descriptive criticism. Describe what you're seeing. And often it helps to work in like quadrants or regions and break it apart so that the painting, this, in, for, for instance, this painting will help reveal itself to you. Then we'll use the same painting and talk about interpretive criticism. So interpretive criticism, it explicate, excuse me, explicates the content of a work of art. Now remember the content is like it's the emotional charge, the meaning, right? I know that subject matter and content are easy to confuse. Subject matter is just what is being depicted. Content is what's the meaning of the work of art. And that's what requires interpretation. And so the content of any work of art becomes clearer when the structure is perceived in relation to the details and regions. When you've gone and done your, your descriptive criticism of the work and you see how parts are coming together to form holes and you've got all that down, you've, you've gone over as much detail as you can, meaning can start to pop for you, meaning or content. Right? So the interpretive critic's job also, though, is to find out as much about an artistic form, like a, a much about the painting as possible in order to explain its meaning. It requires a little research because we don't always know what's going on um, and what we're seeing. And also, interpretive criticism, it relies on descriptive criticism, as I explained. So. Unless we perceive the form and the details with, you know, sensitively and carefully, we're not go we're going to miss a lot of the content or, or not be able to understand it altogether. So interpretive critics, more than descriptive critics, have to be familiar with the subject matter in order to understand the content. You have to know why or who is the woman why or who what or who is being um, what message is being given here who is this why the statues why um why the whys and who's and wherefores of something and that's what you so when you're doing interpretation you got to do a little bit of research
So I'll take a quick crack at that here. Um, so this, turn, as it turns out, the face looking down with disapproval is supposed to be the painter of Salvador Dali again. So this is Dali's wife, um, Gala, and she hated, despised bullfighting because of the violence. So this is her looking down on the bullfighting with disdain and disapproval and hatred. So you find that out when you do a little bit of research. And um, you, and you've, another aspect that, that, that requires research in order to do the interpretation is that if, the fo if this image were more clear, you could see that this part of the bull is like mountains, right? So the bull's dying and the blood is turning into water here, but this part is supposed to be mountains. And then there's mountains over here too. And apparently these mountains that are in the bull are supposed to represent a place known as Capta Creus, which was Dolly's birthplace, his beloved birthplace. And the fact that they're part of this dying bull is supposed to represent his fear of increasing tourism and exploitation of this region, which made him very sad, right? So he combined it with the bull and um, also the boy in the corner. And so flies, you know, which are a common motif, flies often represent death and decay, right? So that can, so the whole notion of flies and death and decay of the bull, death and decay of his home, of his birthplace, right? Um, this in the bottom right, this is supposed to represent Dolly as a youth, as a young boy, just looking at it all. So that's just a quick example of some interpretive criticism. Right? And sometimes the artists themselves will help you with that criticism, and sometimes they want no part of 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 giving you any um, cue, right? So they'll be asked about, what does this mean? What does this re represent? Some artists will tell you, well, they'll do what I just did. And then others will say, that's up to you. That's the point, right? That's almost cooler that way. But I like learning about... Um, I like learning about the content and meaning, personally. And then there's evaluative criticism. To evaluate something really means to say, is it good or bad? How good is it? How bad is it? Right? It's to judge its merits. And evaluative criticism functions to establish the quality and excellence of the work. So you have to make quality decisions, right? And those decisions are best made after you've done the descriptive inter and interpretive criticism. Has this succeeded as an artwork, right? Um, so given this kind of criticism might make you uncomfortable at first, you're being asked to or will be asked to evaluate the merits, quality and excellence of a piece of work when you yourself might not be able to even make a stick figure, for instance, right? It makes you feel like, who am I to say whether this is good or bad? I have no idea what it, how long this took. I have no idea what it took to make this. I have no right. But you do have a right. That's what evaluative criticism is. It just... You have a right, you earn the right by doing your descriptive and interpretive criticisms. You earn the right to evaluate it. And it's put out there for evaluation as well. So even if you're uncomfortable at first, you got to just push yourself to do it. Because remember, you already do it every time you say you like something or you hate something. We're just trying to make it. Um, make you do it better, right? Um, so the issue is how can we use evaluative criticism as constructively as possible rather than destructively? 
How can it be helpful and constructive? How can we use evaluative criticism to help our participation with works of art? And that's an open question, just something to think about. So more um, concretely, evaluative criticism presupposes three fundamental standards. You just got to go with these standards. Right? Once I, I have mentioned this in other aspects of this course, but you have to pretend like there is some sort of objectivity to these artworks that we're going to be looking at throughout the course. Even if you don't believe that there is any, you have to assume that in order to do these sorts of criticisms. You've got to presuppose, for instance, perfection. So an artistic form in which everything works together can be called perfect. And you have to presuppose the standard of insight that the work informs us of some subject matter. It sheds light on something and gives us perspective on something that we may not have had before or it enhances our perspective and gives us insight about something that um, perhaps we knew a little about, but now we know more. And also it presupposes inexhaustibility. And what that means is that the stronger the content, right, the, the richer the insight into the subject matter, the more intense our participation because we have more to keep us involved in the work. And this is, another, this is one of the main reasons why I chose this painting um, to illustrate this. So these works are apparently or can be inexhaustible and evaluative critics usually will rate only those kinds of works as masterpieces that you can return to it over and over and over again and see something new. It's, inexhaustible. Oops, let me bring that back for a second. This is rated as a masterpiece of Dolly's. And then if I were to do an evaluative criticism of this, I would say, personally, after, of course, the descriptive and evaluative, um, excuse me, the descriptive and interpretive criticisms, I would say, I think this painting is perfect. I think everything works together. I mean, par the parts and holes relationship, that particularly works perfectly because it's the parts that give you the optical illusions. It's the parts and the way the parts come together, together that can deliver the optical illusion, the whole of the optical illusion. And the insight, I think this has wonderful insight. I, I am informed of some subject matter more than I was before I first encountered this painting so many years ago. And I find this inexhaustible. I can't get enough of it. And if you go and look on the internet for a better image than this, right, there are some clearer ones that you can, um, that you can focus in on. You can start to see what, what I mean if you focus in and, and look at the way the Dalmatian comes together and what's going on. I mean, in every little crevice, the description I did of this barely scratches the surface of what you can uncover in this painting. So I think this is perfect, insightful, and inexhaustible. You may not, but I do, and that's what's cool. Okay, so topics covered. We went over the goals of responsible criticism, how you are already an art critic just by making choices, you know, between movies, between songs, between types of music, between paintings. Um, you already are an art critic, and our goal is to become a better one, 
And we talked about participation and criticism, and then the three kinds of criticism, which are descriptive, interpretive, and evaluative.